There's a seemingly innocuous piece of data on your phone that actually exposes what you do, especially to Google, Apple, Facebook. This is called the device fingerprint. This uniquely identifies your phone to third parties and likely with your real identity. This is pretty dangerous stuff. And nowadays, this kind of device surveillance will be more rampant in the name of saving lives. What I want to do is to examine this little data point on your phone and see how it can be used against you. Stay put now. A device fingerprint is something available to both iOS and Android. This is a different thing than the browser fingerprint, which I talk about in other videos, because this is specific to a phone. What actually is a device fingerprint? It's any piece of data that uniquely identifies the device among all other devices in existence. Is this a specific piece of data? Actually, it's many potential pieces of data which can be combined and some were available in older versions and some are no longer available in Android 10, for example. Let me just tell you about some of the unique identifiers on your phone. First, we have the Google ID and Apple ID. Now, these are typically attached to financial information such as credit cards, so they have a one-to-one -one match with a real identity. For those with Apple Pay and other financial services, it locks your phone into a fixed identity. Another identifier on your phone is the IMEI. This is the cell modem unique equipment identifier, and this can be retrieved by the OS, of course, and any app that has telephony permissions. So any app that has access to phone data and messages can access the IMEI. Another piece of data that is unique is the notification token. When your device receives notifications, it creates a unique identity called a token, which is available to all apps that handle notifications. This is easily retrieved since most apps have notifications. This is a very important part of Google GCM messaging or now Firebase, and there's a lot of telemetry associated with this. And of course, there's an Apple equivalent to this called an APN. There are other identifiers that may not always be available, such as the device serial number. Some of these pieces of device data become part of the metadata in a photo. So if you upload a photo to Facebook, some of this data is included in the EXIF metadata which also includes locations. Then there are other network unique identifiers which are not normally visible to apps such as the MAC address. But nowadays, this is available to any app that uses the network. There's a Wi-Fi MAC address and a Bluetooth MAC address. And finally, something that is actually sent by the device outside of the phone by default is your IP address, something we already know, and on browsers, a device info identifier called the device user data that is a major part of browser fingerprinting. Now, it's bad enough that there are all these unique identifiers on the phone, but to make it even worse, some of these are combined. So if a third party doesn't have current access to one identifier, they can correlate to another identifier if it matched in the past, if they happen to be able to catch more than one data point at any one time. So if any of the above data points are identified with another data point, you now have a data pair that can be used to index each other. For example, a Google ID can be combined with a notification ID. So next time all they need is a notification ID and they can derive the Google ID. An IMEI can be combined with a notification ID. A Google ID can be combined with a MAC address. Again, if you have a MAC address, then you can guess what the Google ID is. This is part of the sinister aspect of native apps, platforms, and device manufacturers. This type of tracking can easily be used to identify you and often without your permission. Just an example of what one could do with this. This could be used to generate a social distancing data so we can identify individuals by name, not practicing social distancing. This is available to Apple and Google by identifying a device fingerprint 
together with their 24-7 location data. But this is a saving lives kind of application, right? Well, some things are more sinister. For example, every person can be classified according to their religious beliefs, like converging on churches on Sundays, or your health based on who visited oncology clinics or AIDS clinics, or your sexual preferences by who was at the gay bar or the strip bar or who was at a protest. Again, in case you missed it, standard iOS and Android phones have an Apple ID and Google ID respectively, which point to your credit card with your real name and your home location. Obviously, Apple and Google know where the phone is at any one time. This is an insidious threat and it truly bothers me completely. When used with another feature called Wi-Fi scanning, it can pinpoint your movements historically. Again, I want to make this clear. With Google ID and Apple ID, your phones are completely identified with your real name or your family's account. And this is together with whatever behavior is already tracked, like locations, apps used, and websites visited. So without the proper consideration of device fingerprinting, an attempt at pseudo-anonymity in social media may not work. For example, what happens if you set up multiple Gmail accounts on the same phone? Obviously, Google will know the owner of these email accounts even without a real name because they will be connected by a device fingerprint. If you try to use multiple Facebook accounts, you will be spotted immediately. In fact, on any platform where you set up multiple accounts, you can be easily identified. This matters whenever you're trying to create non-real name identities on social media. You may be wasting your time if you're not aware of this. So for example, it is clear to a single platform owner such as Facebook what your WhatsApp account is or your Instagram account because of the device fingerprint. Later on, I'll tell you how to beat this. Now here's an interesting factoid for you. Many of these data points are available to native apps only. This means that some of these identifiers are not available to a web app or browser. For example, it is a well-known fact that Facebook captures your MAC address as one of its unique identifiers. It also captures the MAC addresses of everyone on your network to do relationship tracking, but it requires the app. If you use a browser, it can't get access to this data. So one of the ways to stump Facebook is to never install the app. Native apps can retrieve the IMEI of the phone, the cell modem unique ID, but browsers can't see this. There's another thing that native apps can't see and that's the Google ID and Apple ID. Browsers don't see that directly. You have to log in separately to their platforms. Of course, they make it simple now to identify yourself to each platform using something that will match your phone ID. Many apps offer a Facebook and Google sign-in. And now Apple is requiring that these apps also now include Apple sign-in. These are instead of logging into the apps using your own login to the platform. They call this frictionless logins. But they are also frictionless spying since you're duped into giving out multiple pieces of information at once. By having multiple apps identify you with a Google ID, Facebook ID, or Apple ID, even ad trackers can associate your profile with a real identity while having the platform verify that you're on the same device. I hope you're seeing that there's a problem here. The moment you use an iOS phone, an Android phone, and one of the popular apps with various ad trackers, like Facebook and many apps with Google Ads on it, then you're basically chipped. Every move you make is now the property of various third parties. And to repeat, this is with some way to reference your real name. Okay, now let's talk about how we can beat this. It's not easy. It means making some hard choices when it comes to convenience. First, how do we eliminate the connection to our real name with Google ID and Apple ID? Well, 
This is simple. Don't have an iOS phone or a Google Android phone. If you don't have a Google or Apple account on the phone, then the data will not be available. Let's say you use a Linux phone like Ubuntu Touch, either on a Pine phone or a Nexus 5. Or let's say you're running a Librem 5. These devices have no Google ID or Apple ID, so that will result in no identifiers sent to those platforms. Next, 24-7 location tracking is done by Wi-Fi scanning, which sends the data non-stop to Apple and Google servers. Again, a non-iOS or non-Google phone can't do this. And fortunately, there's another alternative. A de-Googled AOSP Android does not have this kind of Wi-Fi scanning, so this data leak will stop. If you use web apps, meaning use browser-based apps, the device identifiers will be limited. Web apps can do browser fingerprinting, but that does not reveal a real identity, just an indication that you've been seen before. So the less apps you load from a Google Play Store, the less risk of getting device serial numbers and things. So web apps also use a different notification token than a native app so they don't cross over. So web apps are safer. A specific thing with Android 10. If you use a de-googled Android 10, some data points are no longer easily retrieved by an app such as a serial number. Android 10 also does MAC address spoofing, so it also gives information on that front as well. Again, with Android AOSP de-googled, there is no identity. In fact, your identity on a de-googled AOSP phone, like the ones I sell on my store, is shared with so many phones, it's called spoofing, identity spoofing, so your information becomes disinformation. And since you've never logged into a de-googled phone, there is nothing to tie it to a real identity. The main reason for speaking about device fingerprints is that some people think they're hiding by using multiple accounts on different platforms. But as you can see, if this is not well thought out, it can nullify your actions. Second, it also tells you that as a general rule, phones reveal much more information about you than computers. And if given a choice, you should think about separating identities by device rather than just by accounts or by using a computer instead. Third, the device choice matters. It matters a lot. Linux phones and de-googled AOSP Android phones do not leak the same data as your standard iOS or Android phone or some new flagship from Apple, Samsung, LG, Google, and others. There's a lot more about this. I can only give you an overview in a short video. When you start planning on a general security plan, before you jump into setting up multiple email accounts, for example, because I recommend that, you will need to examine your threats and plan to deprive that threat of data. Now let's briefly compare the difference between browser fingerprinting and device fingerprinting. Device fingerprinting is a capability of native app store apps only. You can beat browser fingerprinting by having multiple browsers. You cannot beat device fingerprinting on a single device, except to have a device that does not send a device fingerprint or creates a fake one. But to me, the worst aspect of device fingerprinting is that it is matched to a real identity and to location tracking. So yes, you won't be able to contribute data for social distancing if you follow my tips. Sorry about that, Apple and Google. If this video has been helpful to you, you might want to subscribe to this channel so you get more tools to protect yourself and slam on that notification bell. Thank you for watching.